You know, I, I spent years being in the engineer world, and then I spent years being against it because I don't really give a fuck what it is, man. I don't care if it's recorded through a – the dude made a four-track on a, on a cassette tape. I just want to know that it's going to make sense – human to human whether he can sing me the song or whether the actual lyrics even mean anything you know like those, i mean how much more important are lyrics right. than a preamp yeah. they're fucking massive so you, you know, i'm better off telling telling a guy to change the chorus and to rewrite it than to tell him that we need to switch preamps and make it like sound fatter Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 2020. I'm here with uh, the normal hooligans, Siobhan and Corey. But let's get to the real matter at hand. We have a very, very rad, cool dude. Again, above our pay grade, but for some reason he decides to hang out with, with us. As most are. <laughs> but amazing guitarist in the band Ugly Kid Joe, but he's produced some bands. You know, you may have heard of them. Evanescence, Slipknot, Super Joint Ritual. I don't know, a few number ones for Godsmack. Uh, Mr. Dave Fortman. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So many great stories in this one. We get a little bit nerdy in this episode. If you haven't listened to part one, for sure, go back and listen to part one with Dave also. We also get to uh, debut some new music from him, which uh, was right. unexpected, but very, very cool. So, uh, yeah, a little the treat kind of in the middle here. Yeah. yeah, so stay tuned for a special video release that <laughs> is in this episode. Yeah, so without further ado, let's get into it. Part two with Dave Fortman. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of 2020. I am Siobhan Cronin here, as always, with my cohorts, Ben and Corey, and back for part two, the incredible, incredible, rad, most rad, raddest, excellent rad. I don't even know how many different descriptors I can use. Dave That's Fortman, rad. the incredible Dave Fortman, legendary producer hey of so many of your favorite bands, worked with Slipknot, Mudvayne, Evanescence. We talked about so much in part one, so you have to go back and listen to that if you have not yet. Like and subscribe at 2020-d.com and right let's jump right back in for part two continuing cool. the story yeah man <laughs> new ugly kid joe song have yeah, you guys new checked ugly it kid out joe song yeah i wrote it uh, it's called long road new track we got a bunch coming out we did a cover of uh lola from the kinks coming out in another in a month from now and then we dropped the album but that yeah do you think that's a good time for lola because the lbgtq plus community i do <laughs> are they endorsing the kinks do you think Ben's gonna we'll, get we'll, yeah, We're gonna move on before we get canceled here. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I thought well, Nuno Ben Court already canceled us. Yeah, well, but you Nuno's know, his own. King, he can get it, yeah, cancel himself. He, he's allowed to cancel us. Um, well, you know, since we're talking Ugly Kid Joe, uh, you know, in the previous episode, aside from giving the little promo at the end there, as far as everyone knows, Ugly Kid Joe broke up. So what the hell happened? How come? How come you're making new music now? Good question. Well, well, in that know, gap. <clears throat> now we were. No, it was me and Shannon, man. Um, Shannon Lord. It was my idea. But it hit me, you know, back in 2012. It, it was the, or the end of the session. I forgot what the hell we were doing. I think it was during Live and Inspire for Godsmack. But I, I was telling Shannon, I said, you know what? Like, internet is where, you know, streaming's happening. Everything's starting to sell on the internet. I'm like, why wouldn't we just put out some music, even if you get a misclick, you know, if, like people try to hit cast <laughs> in the field and they miss Cause it happens all the time. I'm like, you know, and we, cause we have the, the full capability of making music. I'm a producer. We can just make music with the band without having a label or anything else. Just put it out. And so that became this entire uh, new resurgence of ugly kid Joe, where they for five years toured in the, and then I went on tour with them seven, 2017 through 2019. Uh, it was a big, long 50th birthday, but <laughs> Excuse me, a little beer burp going on, but that you know, that's how it started, and so we ended up going to the studio and making just an EP, and that led to a couple of years later doing a full length, and now we're, we're starting to realize that you know we have a different approach of putting videos out each month keeps everybody more involved because you know we we did it the old school way I think it was twenty sixteen and that doesn't work that well because it's all social media i mean we you know on youtube you, you have to keep presence constantly yeah. going what do you what do you mean by the old school way just real quick the old school way was like okay we're putting out a video 
and that video is going to lead to the album release. And so you're worried, you know, or you're not worried about me, but you're, you're basing everything off of this one video to get the album ready to go. But instead of that, though, the idea for us now is fuck all that, you know, put four videos out before the album comes out mm-hmm. and just have a steady thing. Almost like a television show, like four weeks from now, you'll be able to see another video. And I think it, it at least for us, because we're old, uh, it's keeping our fans involved because their attention spans are shit because they're old, too. Oh, well, I and think so, that's everyone now, probably. Yeah. I think yeah, in I think, most cases, that's what people are doing at this point. Yeah, that's the way to go. So, but that's the beginning of it was just really me coming up with the idea that we could just release music because I could produce it and, it, you know, let's do it. We have everything on board. We really just don't need a label. Can a band like Ugly Kid Joe afford you? Because you're a pretty big deal. And I feel like <laughs> Ugly Kid Joe is kind of a legacy <laughs> act, aren't they? <laughs> they <laughs> you know, they can afford me because I'm. If, if I'm friends, <laughs> we can afford me. <laughs> well, can back and, can no, back that, no, they cannot afford me. <laughs> friends discount. But I want to ask, going back, what? Uh, and maybe Corey was trying to ask this earlier too. But what? What was the reason for the breakup way back when, when you were first, you know, with them, and then you said the band, you know, kind of stopped oh. playing or stopped recording? What? What happened yeah. there? Well, the you know. Things had it was fast gone downhill, right? You know, could the public's not respond in and we're doing tours and we're not getting, you know, Menace of Sobriety had a little bit of, of success. What was the, the album that we followed up from the, the big American Lisa Wanted or whatever? But it's just when it trails down in popularity, you have to decide at that time, you know, there was no back then, no social media, no, no way to do it on your own. And really, we would have kept going, but. You know, the glue uh, in that band is Klaus Eichstadt. I mean, he's, you know, him and Witt are the original founding members. And when Klaus, he's the first one that wanted to bail. And we looked at each other like, fuck that. If he's not in the band, I don't want to be in the band with you guys. Fuck you. you know. <laughs> yeah. And we were in his living room and I was like, you know, now he's he's the calm mediator, man. He's the dude that could keep it all together for us. And with him gone, it would just become a shit show. I think, and that's at least in my mind, that's what I thought. But also, it, it started to become tiring. In and I had, you know, which I procrastinated for thirty years. But I had, or nineteen ninety six. I don't know. I can't do the math. Twenty something years. But I'm thinking, you know, I'm young, and I'm, I'm making these new demos that are kind of New Orleans kind of music. And I'm thinking, well, fuck it, I'll, I'll try to do my own thing, which I didn't because I became a producer. Shame on me. You know, too bad I became a big famous producer. And all. You know, what a fucking moron, huh? Yeah. But but I am now uh, releasing, about to release some songs. Yeah, I got my first singles coming out September eighth. In between, we're gonna drop them in between the Ugly Kid videos. Wait, you, you, now, when you say yours, you mean Ugly Kid Joe or you, or your yourself? No, I have a I have a solo project called The Wilted Souls. It has this soul singer. Uh, 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 what's her fuck? Aaron Senna. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> well, I had a couple of beers in me now, but Aaron, I found Aaron Senna here in Florida through a friend of mine, Scott Crailing. Uh, and she is the equivalent of, of Etta James on steroids, man. She's insane, you know. Uh, what a talent! So I've written 30 songs or something around her. But we're only releasing one at a time. But the first one, uh, Six Feet Deep, is going to come out September 8th. And, I've, wow. you know, I've been able to play you the stuff, but it's not in my nature to start introducing my shit when you're trying to do your well, I, I can't wait to hear it, though, dude. Cause, yeah, I mean, definitely. So, yeah. Let's explain this. So y- you found a singer. And I want to mm-hmm. hear about how you found her. But when you say you write write a song around her, I understand, and I'm sure Corey does, um, you know, as a producer. Yeah. But, like, you know, what I've learned in my very brief years of being a uh, producer is that you kind of have to be a, a jack of all trades you, you have to know a little bass a little drums a little guitar yeah. when you approach someone like etta james on steroids your quote wh- yeah. what's what's the first thing you do when you're trying to poke the animal and i found this chick you know youtube does wonders for looking for people you know you can actually sit there and audition people by looking at youtube and, and based mm-hmm. on their locations uh and then i was gonna contact this chick man really fantastic singer out of Tampa just to get this project done, you know? So I'd already kind of written, but then as you know, when I tested Aaron out in the studio, I was like, Oh my God, this, this girl is, is, is 
massively talented, maybe one of the best vocalists I've ever actually heard in my life. Uh, then I started to take all of the things that I was working on. And, and at some point I was just like, you know, I was going to start just to do my, uh, my own thing and just sing in my range or whatever. But now we have this song and not all the songs are like this, but we have this song where we sing back and forth and it's, it's, it's pretty badass. Uh, I have a video for it. I don't know if, I mean, I'm not sure if you could, whatever you want to on the podcast or whatever you want to check it yeah, out. But, so, well, if you have yeah, a video, but, give us a link. We'll absolutely put it on the bottom for my mom to click on. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but let me ask wait. what, what, not to stop your train of thought, but what was the, uh, how did you decide like a soul album or like where, where did the concept come from? Was this something that was brewing for a long time? Cause it's like, it seems like you've done a little bit of everything, but where did this one well, come from? Yeah. If you listen to, to my, my songs and ugly Joe, they're very Southern. I'm a Southern dude. I'm from New Orleans. And so I've always wanted to do something that reflected New Orleans. And so this has, you know, clavicle in it and shit. It's, it's, it's like Skinner meets funk in its own way. Nice. Um, I don't know. Can I, can, you want to, you want to hear the song? Should I sing you the song? Yeah, dude, you know, please. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love, I, I can't wait to hear it, dude. Because that, one of the things that yeah. people don't maybe know about you that I, I had the honor and privilege of experiencing firsthand um, is that Dave, like not only has his unbelievably smoky, sexy, angelic voice, which by the way, there's a video online that <laughs> you need to integrate of these fuckers with Shane from Apocalypse Blues Revival doing the perfect renegade intro. <laughs> oh mama, I'm in fear for my life from the long arm of the law. Hangman is coming down from the gallows By the way, with no practice, just like they looked at each other, it was just like this moment. But Dave also <laughs> has this ability, this incredible ability that I have so much respect for to look at you and sing a perfect harmony, like listen to it once, internalize it, and sing any fucking ridiculous harmony, and then think of the next harmony, and then think of the next harmony, and he's already on to like the seventh harmony. You're like, dude, I can't even remember what you did three seconds ago. Calm fucking yeah. down. <laughs> Thank you. You're it's amazing, dude. It's literally like right. watching a fucking genius work. Like that All guy right. over there, that guy, the dude from Lovely Kid Joe, that's the dude singing like that. The guy, the guitarist, that one, him, <laughs> that's that guy. You're that guy. All right. So what would you prefer? I have the finished edit of the video. If you want to see us visually and hear music. Yeah. So is this, uh, is this public or is it unreleased? Unreleased. Yeah. Oh, so Wait. we're debuting this? Oh. Yeah. Yep. My love, would you love me even when I'm deep under the ground? Body's cold, girl, I can't breathe, can't make a sound.
You guys heard it here first. Ooh. Debuting <laughs> on that's 2020. Awesome. That right. was amazing, man. That's that's yeah. incredible. That's the it's, first single. We got a I bunch more of those, yo. Yeah, it's so like, I don't know, yeah, it's got, so, I hear the funk and like her, her voice is really cool. It's got that like kind of, I, I don't know, raspiness or like, yeah. I don't even know anything about vocals, but it's super it's vibey. Anything that makes me start doing like that gooseneck <laughs> thing, like, uh, yeah, that's, that's what, I was what people don't realize is like, that's why Pantera was the greatest metal band, Power Groove. If you force Ben to have rhythm for even a moment, you're, you're killing it right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> no really man that's that's great like uh it's it's got such a groove and uh yeah. you know you know you're, so you're pretty you're pretty good yeah. at the recording thing too it's a great it's a great yeah, sound it's a great sound and record that part of it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what's the goal with that dude because i mean that sounds like it could be on any fucking radio station yeah we're st we're taking a different angle uh my manager gavin McCau uh, mccauley is going to do uh, we're starting in London. We're going to start in England first, and we're not going to try to put out a record yet. We're just going to keep dropping singles, kind of like Ugly Kids doing about every month. And uh, then when we get some traction, if we get some at all, then we'll start to go to uh, bigger levels of like uh, my lawyer, Andy Lurie, is deeply connected throughout Los Angeles. So then we'll start to see if maybe somebody wants to give us some cash on an indie level or, or bigger or whatever. But the fact is, we just need to have some presence, and we're just trying to get on to YouTube, get the social media thing happening, starting September 8th, and then start dropping bombs, man. I mean, I, I wrote 40 songs for this record, and so we're picking, I mean, I have probably six that we'll, we'll make into our set, but, you know, we'll end up with a 10-song album, but the first three or four singles are, are, are dangerous tracks, man. I mean, you ought to hear the, the, the ballad is over the top with this chick yeah. singing. Cannot Ooh, wait. I can't wait. Yeah. That, no, it's, it's ass, awesome. Man. Yeah. Her voice I, is fucking seriously cool. It's, yeah. it's it's such a great vibe. And and honestly, what's so strange about it is that her voice, when it was in a rock band, I didn't think was really that good. But then when she got here in person and she started to apply her talent to to my type of songs, man, she it was in, it was a trip. I was like, God damn, okay, we have something here. And so that's how it all got born, man. I'm glad you guys dig it. And thanks for listening to it. You know, oh, I can't yeah. ask. That's for awesome. But that, that's an interesting point that you brought up that, you know, like kind of switching to a different genre or different context yeah. and suddenly you open up. Have, have you had other examples of working with people where it, it was a matter of like, maybe they had to shift into a different space to kind of open up into yeah. their true potential? I have not, you know, it was the first time in my life where, you know, I had extensively stu studied this chick, uh, in in a rock context and i'm like i don't know man because it, it the delivery obviously it wasn't really doing much for me honestly in scott's band and then because you know he you know me and scott play music for each other all the time and like i'm in his truck listening to this chick sing this, this some kind of song and i'm like yeah she's all right and then when i got her into the to this context man the first day and she started doing all these runs and i'm like oh my god wait this is a soul singer you know, mm -hmm. and, and to answer your question, Siobhan, uh, no, it's the first time I've ever seen that kind of tran uh, transformation into the putting a girl who shouldn't be singing rock into singing funk and yeah. have a chance to do some runs. I mean, this girl, you know, she grew up studying Mariah Carey. I mean, this, you know, she's that good. I mean, she can sit there and run for days, man. You, you, you put her on a track and just say, run your balls off to the end of the song. <laughs> but, and, and it's and I listen back to at least four or five of of the runs that she'll do in sections and I'm just blown away. I'm like, God damn it. This girl's really fucking rad, man. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. It sounds really cool. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, oh, se se September 8th, yeah. we said September 8th, the uh... September 8th is, is the drop date. Yeah. Drop date. Well, the other thing the that I think is really important, the, the really important thing is that, you know, you guys, like you, you and her sound great together. I mean, I've heard your voice, you know, in person, but like you sound great as a lead singer. But then this girl's like, come give me shelter shit on this. Like, yeah, you know what and, I mean? Like, and honestly, crazy. It, yeah, it, it, this is the only song where I'm going to be singing any kind of leads. You know, I'm letting her t take the show. And there's a lot of it where we sing, we'll do octaves together. So it, 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 we're trying to make this, you know, sort of the same thing as we did uh, on the apocalypse where, you know, we already have tons of songs where there's four part harmonies and there's just a big wall. But the main, you know, a few songs that just were it's just I want her to be the main thing because she's such a, a great voice 
you know, I can sing, I can sing all day like I do, but I think that it's better, you know, since I'm 55 and she's, you know, like the late twenties and has a much better voice than me that we focus. Oh, showcase the lady. Uh, you got to showcase the lady. If I have any chance in this world of selling any kind of records, it's going to be based on her talent in my songwriting and not me trying to ball hog uh, the vocal mic. You know, I have, certain parts and I'll back her up and, and some things, you know, it, you know, it, it, me personally, like there are some songs where I have to really train her to sound Southern because I'm, I'm from a Southern uh, enunciation or in pronunciation. Uh, and it's, there's some songs where, you know, like we had to do with Shane, I think, I think both of you guys remember, I think it was a couple of words or whatever. Yeah, we had to drop some. Uh, we had to drop some R's or add some R's somewhere. Yeah, I think. somewhere in there. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not with you. It's with you. <laughs> yeah, with you. And, God bless you. Know, you. Like, and, and people, I think people. You know, we know it because we're in the business and we're doing this. You know, but I think people would be surprised how much you have to change some of the. The, the the way people sing things, you know, because depending on what region they're from, you know, and in Aaron's, I think like some, you know, she, originally from California, but she just, she has a very Northern approach to shit that mm -hmm. I consider to be, look, this is a band from my homeland. I mean, you know, it's, or, I'm sorry, this, these songs are for my people back home. This is for the South, you know, it's for New Orleans to listen to, man. And that's, I always mm -hmm. want to do an album like this. So I stop at nothing to make sure that she sounds like she's coming out of the South. <laughs> <laughs> she's not. <laughs> do you have a big picture yeah. of Ted Nugent on like the wall <laughs> that you could stare at with <laughs> the rebel flag and, and your copy of the Duke outside? Just like, well, you know. he would be the opposite of Southern. I think he's from Michigan. That has about, about zero to do with the South. That shows oh, yeah. you how well, much I know as a damn Yankee. <laughs> Yeah. Well, while we're while we're kind of talking, you know, you know, finding those voices and, and making those making everything be cohesive with the song and everything, can we get a little nerdy for a moment, selfishly, and talk some production stuff? Um, I'd love to. Yeah, and, and, uh, so I want to know, like, when you are getting into a room uh, with someone you haven't worked, you know, worked with before, like, kind of what what is your approach to finding the best way to present them? I know uh, one thing that I heard a lot, you know, sitting in observing, uh, you know, the previous sessions with with uh, Apocalypse Blues Revival is you were like, I like that guy. You were kind of like given like the performance, uh, uh, you know, oh, yeah, character yeah. and you're you know, that's how you were describing it to, to Shane. So can you just talk a little bit about your approach? Well, this is what I can uh, consider to be the most important thing in, in vocals at all is that largely before you get into whether the person singing in key, like, you know, in tune or in time, uh, it's how the person singing is massive. And this is not a huge case, you know, it, in my career, because after Amy, who already had a great character and her voice, this is more when you're trying to develop artists, you know, like, like certainly like Sully, Corey, uh, Chad from Mudvayne. These people already have the character and you know, you know, these motherfuckers. Corey, when they Corey Taylor, not Corey from the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, Corey from the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you can yeah, produce me on the podcast. His voice is beautiful. His voice <laughs> is beautiful. As Renegade will show you. <laughs> Dude, is it not the most gorgeous thing I've ever, but it's, it's, but seriously, you, there's no mistaken. Like when Chad from Mudvin comes on radio, Happy comes on, you know it's Chad. And when Corey from Slipknot comes on, you know it's Corey. When Sully comes on, you know it's Godsmack. And this has gone throughout history. You know, Neil Young, all the great, David Bowie. The, the, the character is, is one of the most important things in, in becoming a star. Because recognition from people being able to tell who the fuck you are is a massive thing. It really is. And how many times do we see bands that come in and they fade out because it sounds... It's just another version of, of sort of like you don't know what fucking band that you, you can't figure out who it is. There's five bands and all the voices sound the same. That's what I always try to avoid. In the in the the quickest way to that, especially uh, with a band like uh, the Apocalypse, really is that how do we get Shane to sound like Shane? You know, and and, and I was so happy when I overheard Benny and Shannon talking about getting rid of that because that was my initial thing from the beginning was, of course we have to get rid of that. So at least I knew I had two more team members 
get it, we're going to go into this with. And boy, that was a comfort. But, and, but when just so when you're saying get rid of that, there was just like a style of singing from previous yes. performances that you wanted to, yeah. to work out. Yeah. And also, you know, more importantly, is it even uh, this? Now, this actually applies to to most singers. If you look at, say, in, in this this actually would apply to everybody else in the world. I mean, it doesn't matter. It could be Sully or Gloria. But if you look at sections, like if you if you sung something in the first verse and you've worked on it, and then you move into chorus, then you in the second verse. What's always important to go back and make sure the things that you love before are the are happening in the second part of this little tiny three and a half uh, minute movie. Because it really is just that we're making a three and a half minute to four minute film with no video. I mean, there will be video later, but you have to make it emotional from front to back. And so I'm looking at character between not just, not just the human, but character between the parts of the song, you know, have we lost that dude? Because it's funny how singers will fall out of their own character mm -hmm. uh, somehow just based on, you know, life man though like, like things can change in a minute like that change everything in the song and so if i'm not policing all those moments is what you what you guys saw me doing with shane where if, if i'm feeling like man the, uh, we're in the second verse and i'm like why doesn't this sound it as good as it did or at least in my mind why does it sound good at all and i'm like well let me go back and find out what i loved about the other one and so you play the singer that one i'm like look that guy is fucking rad and more often than not, they, they'll they'll recognize and go, oh, oh, singing like this, you know. So it's a quick way to get through battling over a second verse that you don't have to sit there and battle over for an hour. You could just go back and listen to the first guy and say, look, you sing rad here, sing like that guy, shut the fuck up and do it again. Well, you brought, yeah, you brought up a really yeah, it's a, great perspective. Yeah. A, a great holistic way of putting that is context. Because context, man. Uh, you know, yeah. there's a lot of times where, and, and I've done this, I'm sure Corey's done this, I'm sure Siobhan does this daily, where you just go down the rabbit hole, you focus on one thing, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this perfect. And then you realize yeah. all the harmonies you spent two hours on don't even work with the song because you've been working yeah. with it soloed. So like one of the things that you did all the time during this record was, well, let's go back and listen to the first verse. And it wasn't just about that dude, but it's also like, where are we going? Where are we coming from? Yeah. And yeah. I I really liked how you did talk about it as a character because it's one of yeah. those things where I never thought about it that way, but you do really have to exude that, emote it through your voice if you're of singing. Course. And the way that you yeah. said it as a character, it's like, wow, I, I've never said that, but now it's like one of those things that Corey and I are like, so go back to that character, dude. Yeah, like, I know I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm already using it. I don't even have clients. And it, good. You guys should <laughs> learn that. Because... Alone. Where's my character? <laughs> by because, myself to sleep <laughs> because it, it look it literally my friends is the most important thing in communicating with with wherever this whatever song you're working on is going to go those things it's how do you drive the listener in and, and simple people hear simple things they're going to hear the vocal first and if if it changes then you've lost like you get excited in the first verse and then the, the same dude doesn't show up and then you're you know <laughs> yeah People start to get drifted. You don't want people, you want to let the, the sheep can't drift. You have to keep the sheep <laughs> stoked the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you, um, interesting. Life, you know. so, so we're talking a lot about vocals. What is your take on instrumental music and how do you, how do you make something with that or keep people engaged or are you not a fan? Oh, no. <laughs> my, my, liter my literal favorite band in the world at this moment in time is Polyphia. Okay. By a mile. I think that Tim Henson may be the greatest guitar player that we've ever seen on planet Earth. And uh, Euphoria, uh, The Goat, all these songs, I think that they may be the most important thing that ever happened to instrumental music in the history of, of Earth. They're my favorite band right now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no way. I feel attacked. <laughs> and one of the things you, I, I wrote down, so I, I actually wrote it yeah. down earlier that you should make your music more dynamically extreme. And I, yeah. we got Nuno to play on our song. And I wanted yeah. to know, like, yeah. how much more extreme can you make a song by getting the guy from Extreme? <laughs> 
Don't even it laugh was, at his jokes. And, and, You're and anyways, him. Back, back to uh, whatever the hell was happening prior Wait, to that. Wait, can we send you the record, though? <laughs> you should listen to some Lost Symphony. It's good. Come on, yeah, let's guys. Let's listen You're to the, the Lost Symphony record on the podcast three and a half hours later. We'll, uh... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Get Jamie, the real-time Jamie criticism. Jamie to it regularly. <laughs> uh, no, but let's go on with this because I want to hear more about this because I, I was curious yeah, about your thoughts on instrumental music because we talked so much me. about vocals. That is painfully funny. That is. <laughs> <laughs> That's making it's, 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 it is the, it is it is painful. I'll give you that. The funny it's, part, the greatest uh, part about that, Dave, is that you're hurting them by saying this by being on my team, and that's why I love you because you are hurting them every time you give me any kind of your any kind of compliment. They're just like, please stop in their minds. You can see it on their face, especially Corey. I'm just trying to figure out how you can have it be more extreme than adding a guy from extreme. <laughs> you know. Well, for those curious, I, go I check it out. To, I find that to be painfully funny. <laughs> I'm, well, I, I actually wanted to answer my only question. You could get Doritos, the extreme ones, and then have Nuno eating the Doritos into the microphone. Okay. And then it's totally extreme. That's, that's even better. Harold and Kumar strike back. So extreme, man! <laughs> and here we are. Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. So it turns out that Benny's not only funny in a session, he's also funny on a podcast. <laughs> like, <he's> a, <laughs> try, try doing 150 of them with him. And then yeah, come we're back. desensitized. Yeah. I can't imagine, man. My, my fucking chest hurts from laughing. God damn it. That was hilarious. But yeah, you know, so my viewpoint on instrumental music is, is a positive one. My son turned me on to it. And out of all the bands he turned me on to, which he knows a million in in these guys also are the definition of how to make a super career on YouTube. Is uh, you guys aren't Polyphia fans? What the fuck's wrong? Oh with yeah, you? no, I've, I I definitely yeah I am. I, I don't listen to them all the time, but I have them on my uh, you know kind of proggy proggy playlist. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah. You go, I mean, Jesus Christ! It's I mean, some of the well questions, man. So well, I mean, no, let him answer the question, man. Said, oh well, okay. Yeah, go on with your train of thought. Save your question. Oh well, I was saying that. You know, some of the pro progression writing is so effective in the same way that I love any kind of other music. And Tim Henson comes up with these just the saddest progressions on guitar being, I mean, it's just it's such a phenomenal player. And I don't know. I just think he's a little alien. And I, I mean, I have been pretty drunk at 1 a.m. and hadn't been crying completely. <laughs> Hate to say this out loud, but tearing up, man. Listen to like Euphoria and some of the great songs they have. I mean, my God, what a fucking blast of talent this world got out of that kid, man. Well, what I was going to say about Polyphia is that they're everything that I love and hate about the internet now because you have all these guitar players that can play for 40 seconds. These Ingve Malmsteen or Eruption, because they've been watching yeah. like, with these Tiger Moms. And then you see it's a seven year old girl from Japan. And the difference is, is that when Eddie Van Halen played it, you could, you knew he fucked your girlfriend and he was smoking weed and drinking. And it's like yeah. that seven year old didn't experience life. So like you have a lot of these in, in my opinion, these people that are like one minute guitar players that have, you know, as Steve Vai said, better talent than them for that one minute. Polyphia is kind of like that craziness, but they've actually parlayed it into yeah, a whole band and whole songs. Yeah. And like, yeah. so for that one minute, they've been able to do it for whole songs. So I hate that in general, for the most part, those insane yeah. shred guitar players with the one minute fucking videos that are like, okay, I give up now. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're just like, oh, they're like 60 minute albums of, okay, I give up now. Yeah. These, these kids, man, I mean, it's Tim Henson and his songwriting, uh, in my opinion, you know, sorry if you got an instrumental band, but I think that he has changed the world. Uh, he certainly changed my life. And I sent it to my brother who can write an entire symphony fucking orchestra on paper. And he knows real music. I mean, and he got blown away by it. I sent him euphoria. He was just like, Jesus Christ, man, the world is changing. Uh, it's my go-to for overall magic and how to, I mean, the, even the sounds, everything about uh, the goat. I mean, just listen to that shit. It's insane. And the emotion involved with the chords that he's playing and, and you forget about the shredding part because it's so the music is so fucking beautiful i'm just I, I i'm over the moon and can't believe that this kind of talent exists on the planet now and i'm so proud 
I don't even know him, but if if I could meet anybody, it would be Tim Henson. I think he's he's the greatest thing that's ever happened to this planet. I thought Kermit the Frog was fucking awesome. I mean, he is pretty right too. Did, 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 did that guy die? The Henson guy, <laughs> Tim Henson. Oh, is it Jim it, Henson? Uh... <laughs> No, it's, t- it's the same kid. He created yes. the Muppets. Yeah. Oh, that makes yeah. so much. He's so talented. It's very, very, yeah, Renaissance man. Um, <laughs> the, so when it comes to your productions, um, obviously, you know, vocal is king. Character is incredibly important. So when you're coming up with a sonic palette to support those vocals, where are you drawing that from? Oh, well, yeah, I'm from the old school. Um, it starts with, you know, maybe a, a mic shootout i've never i mean at least in my history ever had something be, you know you know i use the the good fell in here it's, it's cheap and doable but in a studio where we have options i've never really had anything beat a u47 tube so i just start with the basics i mean you a u47 tube run through a black face and an eve pre from the 10 to the 10 series i mean if you can't work with that you're just fooling yourself because the yeah. rest is all what the talent's doing, you know. And here's a good yeah. example. Here's a great example. From the first time we did the Ugly Kid Joe record in 2012, right? Well, they started in Los Angeles in a studio with a U87 and preamps. And then they get to my big studio. And no, I had a knee pre. I had him singing a 58 in front of the speakers. And it turns out, well, we made the record on Modelo. And so I'm looking at the levels and I'm like, I can't even see the vocal. The, the vocal level in Pro Tools was so <laughs> tiny. You could, it wasn't even, it's like a green light kind of coming up every now and then. And so I was like, holy, f- I blew that shit. I fucked up. <laughs> and so I just went and did gain up on the whole fucking thing. The fact is, I dare anybody to tell me which one's which on that album when it switches it, it sounds just the fucking same it's yeah. all about and and that's why i bought the gift oh, that's a great mic but the fact is the microphone in my history has shit to do with the end product because you can eq the fuck out of whatever the vocal is going to be man right it's going to be down to whether did he fucking actually perform it correctly like or did he give give us something that the world can call valid and emotion you know like these these things are largely more important than, than the sound or the vocal, you know, the, or the microphone, all these things. I'm, I'm you know, I, I spent years being in the engineer world and then I spent years being against it because I don't really give a fuck what it is, man. I don't care if it's recorded to a, the dude made a four track on a, on a cassette tape. I just want to know that it's going to make sense human to human, whether he can sing me the song or whether the actual lyrics even mean anything, you know, like, I mean, how much more important are lyrics than a a preamp? They're fucking massive. So you, you know, I'm better off telling, telling a guy to change the chorus and to rewrite it than to tell him that we need to switch preamps and make it like sound fatter. I don't, I've never, that's, that's definitely the, yeah, you're right. In in terms of, it doesn't matter if you're capturing garbage, it doesn't matter how expensive the gear is, but like when you're, when you're putting an album together, you know, like going back to like the Evanescence thing, they have a sound, not just Amy's voice, but the, the band itself has a sound. Um, Mm -hmm. so when you, when you're working with these artists, you know, going from whether it's building a new, you know, developing an artist like that or a band that's established, how do you build that, you know, the band itself, you know, the drums, bass, guitar, all production elements outside of vocals to create a character that's kind of oh, consistent? Uh, uh, I'll get into science here. And, you know, of course, this does have a lot of value for people like yourselves where you want to know. Well, yeah, this is selfish. I, I just care for myself <laughs> here. This is your wizard. Is that you? <laughs> Are you <laughs> Don Herbert? Just looking at Benny makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> My mom always said I was funny uh, looking. Dude, there, there. Okay, there is a value. I have look. I have insurance policies on big records. If if I'm being hired to do them, right? Well, I have preferred choices. Of course, I'm going to go to an Eve eighty series. You know, in a good studio. Of course, I'm going to just go to the uh, things I always go to. U forty seven, Blackface, eleven seventy six. Uh, in, through a Neve Pre, you know, on an 80 series console. Now, the Evanescence records are special because at the time I had a, a carte blanche, like choice 
of consoles. So I looked up the 88R Neve and in both of the first Evanescence records that I, I did, they're both mixed on 80R, 88R Neves. Now, not bring me life. Jay did that shit on a 9,000. Like, you know, I, I wasn't, no, I, I wasn't even considered to, to mix the singles on that record. And, and so Jay did them. Um, but the rest of the record, which sounds amazing because I'm rad, um, <laughs> fucking is on an yes. 88R. And so, and then the second record I mixed all of, right? And that's on an 88R Neve that was, one of them was at Conway, Los Angeles. One was at Ocean Way down on, uh, on Sunset. But this, you know, the, this amount of equipment, and we're also, remember, each of these albums, man, in Thousand Horsepower, and, and like uh, the Oracle, Godsmack, or Mudvayne, these are all going through SSL consoles, all coming out to very expensive tape machines afterwards. This is part of the process, you know. And only once in my history have I been put in a situation where Sully wants to do it in my apartment this new mix and it came out fat as fuck, but I did have to chase down $900,000 worth of equipment that I don't have in front of me, you know, roughly. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's a process to real albums and most people that are, that are doing real albums, you know, like Chris Lord Algy and those guys, it's the same thing. We're all bouncing out of a major console onto an ATR 102 or a Studer. It all came back to me. I, I don't, I don't know if I should hug you, or punch you because I went and listened to the new fucking Godsmack record and it sounds relentless. It's fucking huge. It's really fucking good. And I know the story. So for people that don't know, you basically remixed one song when you got the masters back and we're like, oh, yeah. well, what if I did this? And then Sully being the guy who's like, oh, let's just make things more difficult. Remix everything for it, man. <laughs> and then I walked yeah. into your studio and it's in your fucking house. You're like, I mixed the record in here. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know if I should be upset about this or feel liberated that no, this is and, done here. <laughs> and trust me, trust me, Sully would have never would have never done that. Uh, it, it was my decision. It was my call. We just wanted to, to get surrender sounding better, and so then I took that and 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 made the leap. And then once I figured out, well, wait, this process. I just developed an entirely different process with the bus compressor in a different EQ. And I'm like, well, look, and I would look the rest. It sounded rad like it was, but the fact was we did have five days left. <laughs> I'm like, well, I got nothing going on. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to, you know, go to lunch. So I'm like, well. <laughs> and so I told him, I said, dude, can I just take, I, let me just take shots at all of it, you know? And so then I started to feed him these mixes. He's like, fuck dude. All right. And it, especially on best of times, which is, one of the most important songs of records, you know, he's like, dude, just when I thought it couldn't sound better, I, you know, I came in with a fucking powerhouse of a different approach to it, you know? So that was my, my idea, you know, and, uh, you know, thank God I did. But I think that for the general public, probably, probably the last three different versions of what we did mix wise wouldn't affect the public. They'd just be like, that's rad. It's a great song. <laughs> I don't think that people get that far into mix details, but as long as you're, if we're going to play the ball game against our peers, which is massive amongst the reputation thing, you know, for, especially for me, uh, might as well make it as rad as you can make it, you know, mm -hmm. if you got, uh -huh. like, like I, you know, I had roughly, it wasn't even five days. I think it was probably under 80 hours left before D-Day. And I'm like, I could sit here. And dick off and just keep listening to it and celebrate and drink smoothies. Or I could just fucking, or I could look, why would, like, why wouldn't you want to go after it? If you just made another single sound better and you have free time, I'm like, well, why wouldn't I want to make this record better, man? I think I did overall, you know, my couple of solos that came out low that I lost sleep over, but then me and Chad, who you met, the uh, engineer, just listened back to all Brad those. Chad. And, it, and, and, and they're audible enough to not be considered muffled. And if it hit, especially stolen fireman radio will pump all that shit up. Cause it's going to take down the kick and the snare a little bit and all the, that's what they focus on some vocals and everything in, in the focal points of the mix. So I'm not going to keep crying at night over it, but this I, so I, funny. Did, yeah. I got to Dave Fortman because literally the, Shannon, yeah. he, he, we listened to the whole record. He's like, what do you think? And I'm like, that's amazing. He's like, do you have any critiques? I'm like, this one solo bummed me out because it was too quiet. 
So yeah. when Dave asked him what, what he thought of the mix, it's Shannon just like, well, there was one solo. And you saw Dave's face just go, oh, you have no, like, you could tell like, he's <laughs> murdered Lost himself. Because when he says D-Day, it means deliver to fucking records. Because you have to yeah. have it, there's not a lot of places to get vinyl. So if you don't get it in on time, you're fucked. So like, you really can't just extend, no matter who you are, you can't extend it because you won't be able to make those release dates. So I, I know that the one critique I made got under his skin, but it made me feel so good because it's like, well, that was my only thing oh. I had to say. And apparently I uh, hit home with it. So no, it my ears must be okay. <laughs> it was perfect. And I think, you know, Shannon needed to hear me, me say it, that, you know, it, and if you listen to the mastering job before the remixes, you know, that the solo on Soul on Fire, especially what was what we're really dealing with, because the rest of them are probably doable. The whole record's like a 10 out of 10, by the way. So everyone knows. Like, we're, we're totally nitpicking the dumbest shit that no one, they'd be like, what but, the fuck are these guys talking about? Yeah. This is how focused that when you mix something with this kind of priority, can become in your life, man. Though, like literally, when we turned, we got to the end, day four of D Day, and we had to turn it in. It was done. I fucking jammed out my cars, and I I realized Soul on Fire, and we're talking mixed nerd world. I, I I was probably down a DB on the solo, and it drove me so fucking crazy I couldn't sleep for fucking three days. I'm like, <laughs> I failed, and I think the kick drum is probably a DB too loud, and so all these things fucked with me so hard <laughs> i couldn't sleep and then they brought it up in the session and i'm like ah, fuck this is gonna ruin my life and it turns out it's it's not gonna ruin my life it's it's a great single the solo is loud enough to at least pass standards but well no hold on first off it's it's it you're trying to get in regular k-rock rotation so just so people yeah. know most people don't even get solos and if there are solos they bury right. them down like the memories at camp so yes. like <laughs> The fact that you could even hear Tony Rumbola soloing, who's an amazing guitarist, may I add, and fucking delivers it on this record. <laughs> but like the fact you could even hear him, like good for good for Tony, he got his moment. Oh my God, you just killed! I mean, you just said it, not killed, but I mean, you just said the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because the fact is, if we, which the dream is, if we can get a a, a mainstay on K Rock, then we win, right? But how you, you're right, Ben, he's right. How much are kids going to really want to? listen to a solo over and over but and they do bury them like camp secrets <laughs> <laughs> but well. but you know as hyper mixer guy right that shit fucking fucks you fucks with you you know i had to have chad tell me like dude calm the fuck down man like, <laughs> you know chad's a mixer and we listened we went to 84 db which is going to be the, the basics you know fletcher munson curve and like can we hear Tony solo? Because I was convinced you can't hear it at all. It's 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 dead. And so I <laughs> and so Chad's all I can hear it perfectly. So calm the fuck down. This will translate in Ted's mastering. It'll translate to most stereos. Maybe some when it's cranked full volume won't have it. But at the Fletcher Munson curve at 84 dB, which means it evens out the human hearing for three and four K, you can hear the fucking solo. Relax. The song rules. <laughs> people are going to listen to the fucking song they're not going to pick on that but i did man and i long before shannon and benny said anything i mean that's the kind of shit you go through when you hyper focus in mixing which i do all the time man i start to lose sleep over things like oh my god tony's never going to talk to me again and then you're gonna cry all the way to the bank when it's another number one single for oh, on the last record number one record and let me tell you i i, I think this one is better if that's possible so they've had it's a bunch of number bad. ones so unless something yeah. like people suddenly stop caring about godsmack which doesn't seem possible to me uh this yeah. is going to be I, mean, I already messaged paul geary their manager and i'm like hey man enjoy your new house he's like what do you mean i'm like the one you're about to buy <laughs> yeah. the one you're about to get if, from this if it does make you feel better though i cry myself to sleep after every mix i do and no one listens to him so it doesn't even matter <laughs> Sign of a true artist. So, so yeah, I don't even get no. the <laughs> I don't even get the benefit of like at least all these people like it. You know? Well just <laughs> the word of of, of truth. Well, send, well I'm gonna send you Lost Symphony though, because I really think you should listen to Corey's mixes and tell us what you don't like. Please about. don't. <laughs> Please yeah, yeah. I think they sound great. I, I think mean, they're the best. Hold on, no. I'm gonna say this. I have I an electrostatic Martin Logan set up at my house. And I always demo all my stuff. I pull up, you know, Aerosmith, get a grip and ACDC back in black and all this shit. 
And I got to tell you, Lost Symphony on those speakers, whatever Corey did, like, that's why I don't even try to mix stuff anymore. Couldn't tell like, you. Let that fucking <laughs> asshole do it. I'm dying. I don't want to go down that. I'm dying to hear it. Fuck, I'd love to hear it. Uh, it's got the extreme so guy on it. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to hear that, man. It's, it's more extreme than extreme. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll text you. But I'll we, text we you do the, the opposite of basically everything you've said. There's yes, it's <laughs> like nine minutes. What's the songs opposite with of a minimal butcher? Dynamic. <laughs> what's the opposite of a butcher? We added. I, I don't know. We had an yeah, eight. We had yeah. an, our, our newest single that's coming out at some point soonish. Uh, started out at eight minutes. It's now at like twelve and a half. Uh, so we're. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the hell we're well, doing. Well, here's. I can tell no you vocals, exactly. No Dave, vocals. Because we're really selling it. <laughs> all we have to do. I'm like you. I'm like. I'm a butcher. I think that every song should be cut down and all that sort of stuff. So I said, yeah, well, what, what if I start a band that's overindulgent, has the craziest guitar players? Like, what if we got Marty Friedman? And what if we got Nuno Betancourt? And what if we got Siobhan to play a bunch of the girl from Trans-Siberian Orchestra and Star Set to play a bunch of strings over my crazy Elton John, Billy Joel piano songs and then extend them. And, and me coming from the classical world with 45 minute concertos, I'm like, oh, well, we can just turn this... 30 yeah. seconds so theme this into a four-minute interlude. I said, fuck singles, fuck even an album. What I'm going to do is copy the overture from Tommy and do all these different fucking themes like it could have been an album. <laughs> could have been. And so I'm just going to make it one fucking song and you either like it or fuck you. And that's what we're doing. <laughs> Rules. And that's why we're in our basements. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Follow me to the path, path of, of total... Uh, uh, to, the, to the unemployment line. Yes. <laughs> that's so rad. Oh, my God. Oh man! Well, listen, oh. we're uh, we are coming to the end of our second hour already. Uh, oh my gosh! I sent you some lost symphony on your this. phone, Dave. It's on your phone. You got it's the link. Amazing. Press the link. I just saw something come up to. You have to send us the unfiltered review of everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I apologize in advance well, for the mix. Just so you know, it won't be any worse than how Marty Friedman feels about the songs he's actually on. So. <laughs> Like Marty Friedman, he played on like four of our songs and you should read all of his reviews in like the press. He's like, those guys really like guitar. Never says anything about us being <laughs> yeah. good or enjoying like, those guys. Yeah, those guys like us. Yeah, he's great too, man. Wow. I mean, we got a, you, know he, you definitely court. know the songs he played. Yeah. 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 Very, very distinct. And check out yeah. Take Another Piece is the name of the song that has. Uh, okay, cool. I, yeah, I'm yeah. going to yeah. check that in court. YouTube link. Alex I got. Skolnick, yeah. And you have Marty Friedman with Richard Shaw, uh, formerly of Cradle of Filth, all together with our resident crazy person, Kelly. Um, and if you don't think that that's guitarded, I don't know what I can do for you. <laughs> can we but, say that? Are we canceled? E, e, uh, enough about us. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, guys, Ugly Kid Joe's got a new song out. You got to check out. It's it's incredible. And also... The uh, Wilted Souls. Y y Wilted Souls. You 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 heard our, the debut of it on the debut. here, but that's going to be out. Uh, was it the September eighth? September eighth. Yeah, I was dropping out. September eighth. Yep. So check it out. Uh, incredible music. Uh, and then you know, at some point, you know, in the next year or so, stay tuned for the Apocalypse Blues revival. Yeah, uh, I'll, sure. I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. When Godsmack have a number one record, we're going to be smart because Shannon. I love Shannon and Jeff. But he's like, let's just release this when everyone releases stuff during twenty twenty. He's like, Benny. It was people told me this was a bad release time. So how about this time we drop it when he's doing 80% of the fucking press for Godsmack when they have like yeah. three number one fucking records and I agree, man. I, what yeah. are you doing then, Shannon? And that's what we're gonna do. So whenever Godsmack begins right number one, which is gonna be soon, you'll hear us. Yeah. Inevitably. But it, it was uh <laughs> it was absolutely an honor to to hang out at your place and to work and to kind of you know be in the room working yeah. on that record together. Yeah. Um so thank, thank you. Down, yeah. Not only for that, but for coming and hanging out with us here. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. This was awesome. And, and I this know was so fun. you have so many stories that we have not even touched on. So, so hopefully you'll come back and hang out with us again. Uh, yeah, bring me back on. I'll tell you the rest. It's a bring, oh yeah, bring we got to talk to for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, two zero two zero dash d dot com. Make sure you like God. and subscribe to the podcast, and uh, we'll see you next week. And so our our reaction creatively was uh, not just a reaction for metal, but also like an answer or a, a, a reaction to being exposed to so much pop music. Um, all of that has kind of gone away with this real niche marketing. And it, it shows in TV and video, uh, TV and, and, and movie as well. Um, if you are only listening to stuff you like, you won't have a reaction to stuff you don't like um 
and it, it limits your your approach to creativity. 